please rise for the, uh, excuse me, please rise as we present our colors. You may be seated. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Welcome to all of our guests, our veterans, our currently serving members, and all of our students. We are so excited for you guys to be celebrating our Veterans Day and our freedom today. I'm just gonna open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great country that we get to live in. Lord, we thank you for our freedom and for the men and women who have so selflessly given of their time and so many other things, Lord, to fight for our freedom. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to just celebrate that and to know that you are a God who's in control and who loves us and who's gonna continue to walk through us through this country as we just share your love and enjoy the freedoms that you've blessed us with. Be here with us today, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, enjoy our band and choir as they share with us. We invite all those who have served or are currently serving with the armed forces. When you hear your branch song, please stand with your family to be recognized. United States Army. States Marines. United States Navy.
Well, good morning. Beautiful day to be here to uh, enjoy our fellowship together and to uh, celebrate service to our country. And we have the opportunity this morning to have Lieutenant Colonel Matt Fries with us. He is the uh, wing chaplain for the 128th Air Refueling Wing in Milwaukee with the uh, Wisconsin Air National Guard. And uh, he's a native of Minnesota. And uh, he and his wife, Nicole, have eight kids. And if that's not enough to keep him busy, he's the wing chaplain as well as a pastor at Pleasant Prairie Baptist Church here in the area. Chaplain Fries has been the Air National Guard an Air National Guard chaplain since 2003 and has pastored churches in Texas and Alaska prior to returning to the Midwest here in 2012. Additionally, he's a, he was the director of development and a teacher at Grace Christian School in Anchorage, Alaska for eight years. He has served God and his country for his entire adult life, and today he's going to tell us a bit about his time deployed to Afghanistan and what God taught him in those experiences. Chaplain? Well, it's so great to be with you, and uh, as I was sitting here at the beginning, I am so grateful you didn't invite me to come sing. Wow, and, and the, the young people, would you please give a round of applause for these young people? Amazing and, and great and that you are using this to glorify God. You know, the, the, the hope of our world, the hope of our nation is always found in the people of the nation serving a living God, amen? And I'm so grateful that we live in a nation that we have the opportunity to be able to freely declare the goodness of God and freely the opportunity to pray for our leadership and to lift them up. And we have a responsibility to do that. And as a chaplain in the Air Force, I have the honor of being able to serve people from all walks and backgrounds and faiths. And some people have said, so how does that work? Do you become a chameleon? Do you change colors when you walk in a room and you become whatever the particular flavor is? And I've said, no, that's not it at all. I, it's, not, it's not what a chaplain's all about. What a chaplain is about is representing my faith background. And I say and have said in many different commander calls that I am a passionate, unashamed follower of Jesus Christ. That I make no bones about that. But I'd also say that no matter what your faith background is or having no faith background whatsoever, I'm your chaplain. So I don't care if you're Catholic or Protestant or you don't have a belief at all. Here's what I believe is that the power of change never happens through Matt Freeze. The power of change in a person's life always happens through the working of the Holy Spirit of God. And as God infuses a person, begins to create that change, he's the one that brings about the change anyway. I'm reminded that D.L. Moody was walking down a street in Chicago one day and a drunk looked up from the gutter and said, I'm a follower of you, D.L. And he said, well, you're obviously a follower of me and not a follower of Jesus Christ, because if you're a follower of Christ, you'd be a transformed person. We never set our eyes on human beings. We always set our eyes on Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. But I've got a couple of minutes just to share with you a deployment that I went on this last year. In fact, last year at this time, I was deployed to the place that is the coldest, windiest, driest, most remote place on planet Earth. And very few people make it to this continent, the continent of Antarctica. This training started off in New York. We went out, a couple of chaplains. There's actually three chaplains that go to Antarctica during the rotation. I went for the first 60-day rotation. I open it up. In fact, it might surprise you to know that the people at the South Pole have been there. The last plane left out of the South Pole the end of last February. And the first plane is showing up here in a couple of, actually about now. The, the first plane will show up and bring what they call them as the winter overs down in Antarctica. It's at the South Pole Station. I was told by one of the winter overs last year that the coldest temperature that he experienced the year prior, over, over the year, was 195 below zero. Can you believe it? And he had to walk outside and go out to a, a station. Anyway, I could tell you lots of stories about that, but we did training in New York. And we went, and uh, one of the hardest parts always is leaving your little ones behind. So for a service member, when you get ready to go, you're trained to go, you're excited to go, you're amped up to be able to go, but you hate leaving the little people behind. And this is a picture of three of my little ones, uh, Samuel, Hope, and Eliana. 
and I recorded, they didn't know it, but I recorded me reading some books to them. So they're actually watching me read them a story as I'm deployed. And a lot of service members get this opportunity to experience uh, what that looks like on the way to, now this doesn't look like Antarctica, does it, to you? You know, my family chides me a little bit that the chaplain does all kinds of fun activities. I play volleyball, I go to barbecues, I do, you know, I horseshoes when I was in Afghanistan. I, I did a lot of different things. And they say, are you really working? I said, of course I'm working. That's what I do as a chaplain, right? I'm uh, a part of where people are at. But New Zealand was on the way and I had the opportunity to visit there and see New Zealand as a beautiful place. I won't spend any time on that. But we finally made it down to McMurdo Station. We fly from, it took 44 hours to get actually to uh, McMurdo Station from here flying and layovers and everything. But when I finally got there, McMurdo Station, there's three stations in Antarctica, McMurdo, the South Pole and Palmer Station. And McMurdo was where I was at. So I had the privilege of serving about 900 civilians there, scientists, and about 200 military members at McMurdo Station. That's McMurdo Station there sitting right on the sea ice. We had penguins and seals that would come up right along the side. In fact, I saw emperor penguins, which was pretty cool to have them walk right up to us. But this community here is a community of primarily scientist folks. And I would say that in this community, I had the opportunity to share Christ in a lot of different scenarios. And I'm gonna share just one. That's the chapel that I worked out of. And uh, one of the things that I did, I am a, I'm a person, there's a couple of philosophies in ministry. One is you can wait for work to come to you. The other is that you can go to where the work is. And I'm of the latter opinion. I like to go and engage people where they're at. And one of the activities, in addition to Sunday services, I did a lot of different community type of events. I hosted races that took place. And, uh, but this is one that I had every Sunday. I did a trek with the chaplain. And you could only go on these hikes with another person. And so I would take people out on these hikes and we would tour around the area. But uh, it was a great way for me to connect with individuals. This is another station, Scott Station was the New Zealanders. And the New Zealanders would see me come and they'd say, oh, the chaps here. And chaps, where's, where's the lollies? And, uh, and I just smiled at first. You know how you smile and nod and you just don't say anything because you don't really know what they're talking about. But the New Zealanders are called Kiwis. And, and to me, that sounds a little bit derogatory, but they like the name Kiwi. So I wouldn't like to be called a Kiwi, but they like being called Kiwis. And they'd say, chaps, where's your lollies? So finally I asked them, I said, man, I don't even know what lollies are, let alone to bring you any lollies. What are you talking about lollies? And, and they said, lollies, candies, candies, mate. That's what you bring is candies for the, for the troops out here. So Scott Base was a place that I would uh, serve as well and go and support them. Last Veterans Day, I was down there. We did a joint service with New Zealand and I'm here doing the invocation and speaking there as well. This is South Pole Station. I'm gonna wrap it up. But South Pole Station here was a fantastic opportunity. It really feels like you're at, in space, at a space station. It sits uh, two miles. There's two miles of ice below this station down to the continent itself. And a lot of stories I could tell you about that. Here's the uh, geographic and the ceremonial South Pole markers that I went out to. It's about 70 below in that picture. You can't tell it, obviously. But the final thing that I'll say is this. I had lots of opportunities to share my faith. And one final word that I'd say is a man named Patrick. Patrick uh, was a gentleman who I introduced and I, I got to know as he came to McMurdo, I welcomed him and then he was going on to the South Pole. He had a number of different things that he sat down and talked with me about, but as a chaplain, it is uh, one of the pieces that people understand and know that when they talk to me, it's complete confidentiality. I have a duty to not report. So when they share that information with me, it is, it is safe and secure and they don't have to worry about it impacting their job. And Patrick sat down and shared a lot of things with me that I won't share now with you here. But one thing Patrick said to me is he said, I want you to know I'm an agnostic. In fact, most of the scientists down there were agnostic. And you know the difference between an agnostic and an atheist. An atheist says there's nothing there. An agnostic says there's maybe something there, but I don't know that I really know what to put my faith in. And I'd say that that's pretty interesting to see, that you have a group of scientists down there studying many aspects of science in the universe that say this is too complex, too amazing for it to have been an accident. There has to be something behind it, but I don't know for sure what it is. Patrick was one of those people and I had the opportunity to talk to him even at South Pole Station about the Lord and to share Christ. I don't know what happened with Patrick. I have no idea, but here's what I know, what I started off with. The change in Patrick's life 
The change in Matt Freeze's life, the change in anybody else's life, doesn't happen because of the schnaz of a person. It happens because of the power of an almighty loving God that reached down in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who died willingly on the cross for our sin, paid the ultimate price, raising again on the third day to promise to us life eternal. No one gets off this earth alive. And I am guaranteed that when I leave this earth, this tent will be gone. And the next one that I have will be free from the sin and the pains of this world. People, the best is yet to come. And I'm excited about it. And when you see me in glory, I'm gonna have Absalom locks flowing long hair in glory. God bless you, thanks. Thank you so much. Anyone who knows me knows that I truly believe veterans are the heart and soul of our nation. I'm Susan Nelson. I'm the superintendent here at Christian Life School. I too want to welcome each veteran, each family member, and of course our students for being here. I want to say that I am so honored for so many special guests in the room, specifically our veterans. Also, of course, we have our governor here, and today, I have the privilege of honoring and introducing that special guest, 45th governor of this great state of Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Freedom, endowed by our Creator, defined by our Constitution, 
but defended each and every day by the men and women who proudly wear the uniform of these United States. Children just sung very well about protecting freedom. And the men and women who do that every day are here in uniform and are the veterans that we recognize before and will in a moment, but we cannot recognize you enough. So if you are a veteran or a service member or a family member of a veteran or service member, would you stand or wave at this time? We'd like to acknowledge you yet again. We appreciate the service and the sacrifice of each and every one of you and those that you represent. I particularly want to thank everyone here, but, but uh, Superintendent Nelson, thank you and your family, both in service and sacrifice. Obviously, uh, we know having both uh, your husband in the service and obviously knowing the sacrifice of your son and uh, what that means, not just to your family, but to this country. Uh, we thank you, as we do to many others here who understand the importance of service and sacrifice. I, I grew up uh, just down the way uh, in a small little town called Delavan, just a county over in Walworth County. Uh, when I was young, I was in the orchestra and the band. In fact, I played like the guys in the back here. I played percussion, uh, so I remember playing that. And in both school and in our church, we had a little orchestra as well, a church. And the director, we, ours was much smaller, we didn't have to dress up quite like you guys are doing. Didn't look as sharp as young uh, women and men who are here today. But we would occasionally play uh, different songs. And the director of our choir, or excuse me, of our orchestra, was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Kahn. Claire Kahn was a member of our church. He lived about three houses up the block from where my family lived, my brother and I and my mom and dad. And Mr. Kahn was a veteran, a veteran of World War I. In fact, actually, he served in World War I and in World War II. And then he came home, and he worked for the city. He was an engineer for many years, and he didn't just do that. He was the director, as I mentioned, of the orchestra at church. He was active in church. I was in scouts, and he was our assistant scoutmaster. In fact, every year around Memorial Day and Veterans Day, he would get all of us scouts to go out in uniform and put American flags on all the graves all the way back to some of the folks that had been some of the earliest wars in, in our time. He made sure that even though the descendants of the individuals who were buried there were long since passed, that, that every year, every one of those ceremonies, there was an American flag on their grave. And he, he served in other ways too. He was a part of the American Legion post and he'd serve when we played Legion baseball and he'd be down there helping the others even though, as you can imagine, even back when I was a kid, which was a long time ago, but, but at that point, he was still pretty old because he was a World War I veteran. And he'd be down working the concession stand at Legion baseball games and helping out when the American Legion would do other special things. And when I think of veterans, I think of not only his time overseas, because he would still have, he'd show my brother David and I some of the shells he still had from World War I and some of the things he had somehow brought home with him. That certainly reminded me uh, of what a veteran was, but I also saw what a veteran was by all the things he did to continue to serve, not just his country, but his community when he came home. And I particularly remember when, when I had a chance, and for any of you who are, who are seniors uh, and, and trying to wonder what the next step is, is it college, is it a technical school, is it uh, an apprenticeship, is it a workforce, whatever it might be, but the summer going into my senior year in high school, like some of the, some of the students are thinking ahead to right now, the American Legion post in my community of Delavan gave me a chance to go to a program the Legion runs called Boys State. And I got a chance, an opportunity to be one of the two that went to Washington to go to Boys Nation. And I, I'll never forget that because it changed my perspective. It opened my eyes, not just the government and politics, but the public service. And it all went back to that post. And back in Delavan, just like posts all across the state and all across this country, they ran that program both for young men and there's a girls state and girls nation for young women as well because they so, so much wanted to make sure that the service and sacrifice that our service members provided wouldn't be forgotten and that there'd be a sense of patriotism and pride in our country that regardless of political party or persuasion or wherever you might be voting in the future, what they wanted wasn't to just 
have people who are voting one way or the other on a given issue, but rather people who understood the importance of the freedoms that so many had fought for and many had made that ultimate sacrifice for. I was thinking about this earlier this year. The, the American Legion post in my town has four names on it, the town I grew up in. One of them was named Bovio, which didn't make a, as a kid, was just a name on a wall. It was a name on the side of the post and inside on a wall where they, they listed all sorts of names. But as I grew older and knew people like Mr. Kahn, and I realized that the name was up there for a purpose. You see, the name of Walter Bovio was one of the names at that post because he had died at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. And I had a chance this last February to go for the very first time. Never been to Hawaii before. I had to go and give a speech, and so I set a day aside to go over the USS Arizona Memorial and saw the listing of the names. And there was Walter Bovio from Delavan, Wisconsin, age 19. He was 19 years old, only a couple years older than most of you here. In fact, actually, it's interesting, too, another Wisconsin connection, the, the captain of the USS Arizona, the, sh the ship upon which that memorial is built on top of, was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he had a chance to leave. He had a chance to, to depart the ship, but he wasn't going to leave while there were still sailors on board. So he, too, the captain of the ship, went down. And that is his eternal resting place. And it's interesting, being there, it reminded me again of how we think about veterans, particularly those who made that sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, that, that theirs is a lasting memorial. It's not just on a post, it's not just on a sign or in a memorial. The best way we honor those who've made that sacrifice, the best way that we honor those who've made that commitment to serve our country, isn't just through programs like today, it isn't just through memorials or veterans posts or other things, it's making sure a little bit of them lives in each and every one of us. That we don't take for granted the freedoms that we hold. We don't take for granted the liberties that they fought for, the, the things, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, that Chaplain Fries just talked about, the, all the things that come a part of being this great country. Many may not know this, but on July 4th of this past year was the 240th anniversary of this great country. 240 years ago, the founders of this country declared our independence. The only great country in the world whose entire being is based on the concept of freedom. Freedom that means it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you, your parents do for a living, it doesn't matter where you were born or what you look like, it doesn't matter what job or occupation you have, that in America, everyone is free. The freedom of opportunity is there for everyone out there. What you do with it is up to you, but that freedom is inherent in the very essence of our country, one of the few countries in the world who can say that. In fact, there's, that's why there's so many people that want to come here. You never hear about people wanting to leave America. You only hear about people wanting to come to America because we are that freedom. We are that beacon that people want to be drawn to. And so today, we honor veterans, and we will through next week in particular on the 11th and the days coming up to that. Let's make sure that Veterans Day and ceremonies like this aren't just a one-time-a-year event, but that we remember our veterans, we remember their families, and that we particularly continue not just on our veterans, but, but those who are still serving in harm's way today. And so I'm going to ask a little ending point. I'm trying to think if I see it. They're a little bit ways away. But can I get two volunteers, ideally two tall? I need really tall. So a couple of the taller students over here. How about way in the back, right in the middle with the, I think you got red on. Come on up. And how about right here? You can come right up here. So I've got a, a job for you. Come right up here in the middle with me. I want you to help me. This is a big flag. I'm going to have to cover up that Bears uh, jersey with the uh, big flag. Huh? Although you guys did beat the Vikings the other day, so I'm kind of happy about that. Okay, so now that's the flag of, of the state of Wisconsin. Now we've got all the service flags. We've got the American flag up there. We saw it before. Each of the five branches. Love the fact that each of the service songs were, 
were given there. I love clapping. Superintendent Nelson probably thought I was goofy. I still clap after the applause. I'm still clapping along because I love the beat on each of those. The orchestra and the, the chorus were great. I love that. I, I love the service flags. I love Old Glory. Wonderful stories about that. But a lot of people don't know the story of the flag of Wisconsin. So you're all going to get a free history lesson today. And it actually ties in well with something I have in my, in my pocket here. And that is I carry each day the United States flag, which is from one of our units, an Air uh, National Guard unit. And the other side, I carry a patch that one of our Army units in the National Guard gave me when I was out training with them. I try to go out with each of our units in the Wisconsin National Guard. And the reason I carry this is because even as we speak, there are men and women from Wisconsin deployed in harm's way. A lot of times we don't think about that because we've heard all these stories about the drawdown in troops in, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and others around the world, but we don't realize there are even people there now and there's new ones, new groups of people even getting ready to be deployed, whether it's in the National Guard, the reserves, or in active duty from Wisconsin and all across the country. And so one of the things I do at each of the deployments is I give them a little history lesson as well. A lot of people don't know this flag this flag goes back not to 1848, that's when our state started. It goes back to 1863. 1863, now think for a minute, if you know anything about history, what was going on during 1863? Civil War, right? 1861, 1865 was the Civil War. When the middle of the Civil War, even though we were a pretty young country, or excuse me, pretty young state at that time, we had just been founded in 1848, Wisconsin sent more than 91,000 soldiers to fight in the Civil War. We were a new state, we only had 775,000 people roughly, and we sent 91,000 soldiers to fight in the Civil War. That was a war that was fought far away from Wisconsin. That would have been one out of every nine man, woman, and child in the state at the time was a soldier in the Civil War. And so in the midst of the Civil War, soldiers far from home asked for something to remind them of the people back home. And so the leaders of the state at the time created a blue flag. The only thing that's different today is it was a blue flag with the seal on. Later they added Wisconsin in 1848. But this essentially is the flag that was sent to the troops more than 150 years ago. It was a reminder of two things. One of the people back home, their family and friends, and secondly, something I'm going to ask you to do, it was a reminder that there were people back home praying for them. Praying for courage, praying for strength, praying for perseverance, praying for their safe return. And so the reason I tell you that today is not just because you get a, an extra special history lesson for all of you students here, and adults probably as well, but I would ask that in addition to what the good things you think about when you see our nation's flag, now, here on the stage, on a pole somewhere else, every time you see a Wisconsin flag, would you take a moment and stop in your travels, in your day, in your actions, wherever you might be, and say a little prayer. Say a little prayer for the men and women from Wisconsin and their families who are deployed even as we speak and will be in the coming days, weeks, months, and years to come. Because that's one of the best things we can do to support not just our veterans, but our service members. So we go with prayer. Dear God, we, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for this wonderful tribute to our veterans, their families, and our service members. We just ask that in addition to the tribute today that you would continue to lift up those men and women who are serving in harm's way even as we speak, that you would be with them, that you would grant them clarity of mind, courage and comfort, knowing the presence of your mighty hand upon them and no matter where life might take them, that you would support their families, and friends in ways that they never dreamed possible, and that if possible, you would give them a safe return to this state and to this country. We thank you to be living in the freest country in the world, and we ask that we never take it for granted. In your name we pray, amen.
We are so excited that all of our veterans and currently serving members are here with us today. And we want to take one more opportunity to just honor you and to say thank you for the sacrifices that you have been making throughout your life and that your families have made. So at this time, anyone who is a veteran or currently serving, if you would please come down front and join me on stage and join us on the, on the risers, we would love to say thank you to you. Thank you. Our students now have a song for you, so I hope you enjoy.
Well, I would like to add to the many thank yous that have been given. And uh, as you were all walking up, just the long line of all of you and those of you who are here in the front, I couldn't help but think about the very large amounts of sacrifice. And I'm sure if we were to go along and hear every story, uh, what that sacrifice has meant to you, to your families, uh, even the wounds and scars, both physically and emotionally, that you still carry today. And we just want to say thank you for those of you who have sacrificed great amounts, way beyond our imaginations, for protecting us, for giving your lives. And uh, I'd like to just pray for you and for this day, a prayer of thanks. Father God, we thank you for the sacrifice that you gave that you gave your all. You loved us so much that you gave everything for us so that we too could have freedom in Christ. And Lord, these veterans have followed in your footsteps and said, we are going to give our all. We're going to give our very lives so that our country can have freedom and those that live in this country. And God, we thank you for that. We pray, Father, for healing over those wounds, those scars over families that are still hurting. The, the sleepless nights that some of our veterans still carry, the fears that are still there. Father, the physical wounds that, that so many of them are, are still living in their daily reality of. And we pray, Father God, it, you say in your word that it is by your stripes, by the sacrifice you paid that we are healed. We pray healing over our veterans, over our families who have sacrificed so much. And God, we pray your blessing, your favor, your goodness, your healing over each of their lives and their families. And God, we also thank you for the Cubbies win in the World Series. In Jesus' name, amen. Preach, brother. That might be my favorite sermon that Pastor John has ever given. I would like for you to please rise and remain standing for the retiring of the colors. Guests and students, please remain seated while our speakers and VIP guests exit.
Thank you all so much for coming today. Again, I hope that uh, today that we were able to just honor you with the, the, the honor that you guys deserve. Uh, we would like to invite you to stay uh, with your families, whomever, for uh, a light breakfast that we have prepared for you uh, after uh, the service is here. So, just the veterans and families, you're going to be the first ones out the doors. You're going to head straight down the stage, and uh, there will be reception immediately following. Thank you. Thank you. 